You can say what you'd like about Hitler, but there's no doubt that he performed an economic miracle in Germany before the breakout of World War II. Before the dictator took to power, Germany was in dire financial straits. Crippled by the terms of the Versailles Treaty, the Weimar Republic was then shattered by the Great Depression of the 1920s. People were living in serious levels of poverty. Children became homeless, begging on the streets for enough money to eat. The nation's currency became so devalued that people had to take wheelbarrows of money to bakeries just to buy loaves of bread. Many Germans were left with no choice but to earn money through less savory means, such as prostitution. After seizing power in the 1930s, Hitler transformed this beaten nation into a proud, successful, and innovative world power. Perhaps most importantly, Germany developed one of the most advanced militaries of that era in less than a decade. To regain our place among the strong nations of the world, Hitler's seductive promise. The Versailles Treaty had left Germany weak. If Germany rearmed, the Allies could invade. Hitler had called their bluff. He'd pulled out of disarmament talks. He'd brought back army training for all German men. And in 36, he'd marched into the Rhineland. How was this possible? Who funded Hitler's rise to power? The answer may surprise you. In his book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, Anthony C. Sutton writes that the Dawes plan was vital to the rise of Nazism in Germany. This plan was devised by the United States, and it involved providing loans to some of the largest cartels in Germany. These loans were essentially corporate bailouts, designed to kickstart Germany's economy and restore it to its rightful place as one of the economic powerhouses in Europe. Of course, the implication is that by bailing Germany out, the United States received power and influence over the struggling nation as a result. First, there was IG Farben, the chemical company that would later create the infamous Zyklon B gas to execute Jews and anyone else the Nazis considered undesirable. This company had a counterpart in the United States called American IG Chemical Corporation which was essentially a carbon copy of IG Farben. Several of its directors were US citizens in 1930, including individuals who represented the Federal Reserve Bank. Interestingly enough, Zyklon B gas actually had its roots in the United States. The gas is a form of hydrogen cyanide and it was used in California in the 1880s to kill pests on citrus trees. By the 1920s, U.S. Customs officers were spraying Zyklon B on the clothes of border crossers at the Mexico border, and officials even referred to the spraying facilities as gas chambers. Then there was AEG, also known as simply German General Electric. During the war, this company benefited immensely from slave labor, supplied by German concentration camps. About 30% of German General Electric was owned by International General Electric, located in New York City. This company also had several US citizens as directors. Another noteworthy company that received loans from the United States during this period was Verenicht Stahlwerk, which translates as United Steelworks. 
This company was instrumental in producing coal, iron, and steel for the Nazis during the war. German industrialists traveled to the United States and examined the production line techniques used in the car factories of Detroit. They would later use these techniques to create some of the most notorious war machines of the Third Reich. Techniques for creating synthetic rubber were also imported from the United States to Germany. Perhaps the most important contribution made by the United States to the Nazi war machine had to do with synthetic oil production. Companies in the United States transferred their patents to these German cartels, allowing them to synthesize oil from coal. This accelerated oil output sharply and allowed the Nazis to fuel their war machine. Some US military officials warned that sharing vital technology in this manner could have grave consequences in the future. Germany's two largest tank producers were Opel, a subsidiary of General Motors, and a subsidiary of the Ford Company. Henry Ford was even given awards by the Nazis for his services to the Third Reich. With the exception of the Ford Motor Company, all of the US companies that were contributing to the rise of Hitler were controlled by just a handful of Wall Street elite bankers. Somewhat ironically, it was Henry Ford who once said, If these financiers had their way, we'd be in a war now. They want war because they make money out of such conflict, out of the human misery that wars bring. Ford himself profited immensely by funding both sides of the war, as he had factories in France, Germany, and even in Soviet Russia. In his book, Sutton also argues that numerous electrical factories in Germany were never bombed because they were owned by US subsidiaries, such as General Electric. This allowed the Nazis to continue producing electrical components for mines, explosives, searchlights, and communication equipment virtually unhindered throughout the entire war. The implication is that these factories were too valuable to the Wall Street elite and so they were intentionally avoided by US bombing runs. The British Royal Air Force obviously didn't get the memo when in 1942 they bombed a Ford factory in Poissy, France. The factory was being operated by the Germans. This was seen as highly controversial and a mistake, with the Allies carefully keeping the factory's connection with Ford out of the newspapers. In addition, the Vichy government of France paid the Ford Motor Company 38 million francs as compensation for the damage. According to official records, a number of questionable individuals contributed to the Nazi party prior to the 1933 election that saw Hitler seize power. These included Edsel Ford, Walter Teagle, and C. E. Mitchell, all U.S. industrialists and bankers. I. G. Farben and General Electric also made significant campaign contributions, and we have already established their connection to Wall Street. There was also Ernst Hofstangel, a German individual who eventually moved to the United States during his early years and attended Harvard. Later, he contributed immensely to the Nazi party. Heinrich Imla's father was a teacher, and he also brushed shoulders with Franklin D. Roosevelt at Harvard. After attending Harvard, Ernst went on to start an art business in New York, but later became one of the key members of Hitler's entourage. He was even rumored to have saved Hitler's life in 1923. Ernst also helped finance the first Nazi newspaper and the publication of Mein Kampf. He eventually fell out of favor with Hitler, ended up in a Canadian POW camp, and was subsequently bailed out by his old Harvard friend, Roosevelt. This interesting character 
shows us that there were surprising connections between influential figures in both the United States and Germany during the war. One of the people who profited considerably from the rise of Hitler was Senator Prescott Bush, the grandfather of George W. Bush. In 2004, The Guardian reported that they had discovered files from the U.S. National Archives that suggested he worked for a firm called Brown Brothers Harriman, BBH. This firm allegedly acted as a U.S. base for a German industrialist named Fritz Thyssen. Thyssen was one of Hitler's biggest financial contributors during the 30s, although he too eventually fell out of favor with the Nazis. Prescott Bush was apparently a shareholder and director for many of the companies associated with Thyssen. Some even suggest that Prescott used the profits from these companies to set up the legendary Bush dynasty, paving the way for his descendants to seize considerable power in the United States and reach the presidency. Prescott, his son George, and grandson George W. were all members of the Secretive Skull and Bones Society. As a result of the war, Many of Prescott's assets were seized by U.S. authorities due to their obvious connection with Nazi Germany. In 2015, the National Post ran a story suggesting that six months before the Second World War broke out, Great Britain gave Hitler $9 million in gold. The Bank of England apparently agreed to surrender the gold, which actually wasn't even theirs to give away. The gold was owned by the National Bank of Czechoslovakia, and this incident left Winston Churchill incensed, as it occurred just moments before he asked British citizens to join the military and fight against the Nazis. The gold went directly to the Bank of International Settlements, and for some reason, The Bank of England continued to insist that this bank was neutral. In fact, it was masterminded by Hitler's economic genius, Hallmark Schott, and was bankrolling the Third Reich. The Bank of International Settlements was also led by an American banker named Thomas McKittrick. Even after the United States entered the war in 1941, McKittrick managed to keep the bank going. In fact, he was apparently cutting deals with the Nazis even while Americans were dying in Europe. The Bank of International Settlements still exists to this day, and it is known as the bank behind central banks, and a central pillar of the global financial system. It was also instrumental in the creation of the Euro. Despite serving an extremely small elite group of 140 customers, its annual profits number in the billions. So was this all just an unfortunate accident? Did American bankers and corporations unwittingly fund Hitler, never expecting him to spark the largest conflict this planet has ever seen? Maybe. This is certainly what mainstream historians will tell you. They point out that the global financial system is inherently intertwined, and that everyone is always doing business with everyone at any given time. But the fact remains that a handful of Americans profited immensely from World War II. In fact, the war couldn't have come at a better time, as it helped pull the United States out of a major depression. Even better, the war helped establish America as the new global superpower, replacing Great Britain's war-shattered empire once and for all. Whether it was intentionally engineered by Wall Street or not, Hitler's rise to power was certainly beneficial in the long run. And this is of course how all wars go. The majority of people suffer and die while a few wealthy individuals rake in the profits. So did the Wall Street elites ever face consequences for their contributions to Nazi Germany? 
Of course not. At the Nuremberg Trials, only German directors of major Nazi corporations were put on trial. American-born financiers who served on the boards of these companies were never mentioned, and they certainly didn't face accusations of war crimes like their German counterparts. Even Germans who had connections with the United States banking elite walked free. Prior to the Nuremberg Trials, Hitler's financial right-hand man, Hamar Schacht, famously said they don't hang bankers. He was proven correct when he was acquitted on all charges, went on to found a private banking house in Dusseldorf. Perhaps we should be a little more wary of the true architects of major conflicts. If you follow the money, you might find that the trail leads to just a few members of the so-called Wall Street elite.